Cool. Okay. Um, so this is quite closely linked to the chapter from last week, I think, which was the function factories. And this one is function operators. Um, so we should be able to define a function operator and explore some existing ones and make our own as well. Okay, so, um, so the function operator just takes one or more functions as input and then it returns a function as output. A special case of function factory since they return functions. And function factories return functions, they don't they? Um, it's just that the input for function operators are also functions. I think. Um, and so they can wrap an existing function. I don't know Python well enough to um, comment on their decorators function uh, there. Um, so I might just run some of this code. So we've got a chatty function, um, which, so what does this actually do? So it takes in an argument X and then any other arguments. The res is then function of X. And it just writes out a message and returns the um, function, which is res. Um, Okay, yeah, so chatty, the, the input to chatty is a function. What is it? Yes. Um, and then it's then makes this function, function x, uh, Okay. F is, I don't think I need to do her. Let's just see what the so uh, why okay. why they, they add force in the with in the function to, for, to force um, an evaluation of an argument. Yeah, because I think cause that was in last week, wasn't it? That if you didn't do that, then it was only lazy evaluation. So that um, it wouldn't evaluate it if it didn't need to, or if you changed F afterwards. Uh -huh. It only evaluates it at the time. Um, but yeah. I'm not really, in, I'm not entirely sure how this um, all <laughs> uh, works, to be honest. My brain's a little bit fried, so I'm trying to uh, <laughs> work out what it's um, doing. Yeah, okay, let's have a look at the actual chapter. Um, so... 11.2 has existing function operators, um, which does it have? Okay, so it's has got those in the notes. Um, so per safely captures errors and turns errors into data. I 
the yeah. operators are such as uh, the operators, uh, the the pipe. What what are the operators? So the uh, operator which assign a uh, a name to an object. Uh, uh, I mean, assign uh, an object to a name. Um, the assignment operators and then the eventually the pipes operators are those operators. So I think you can use the operators or the, the function operators. Um, so in function operators, safely minimize. No, I'm not there. Yeah. So I got, the first things I think about for operators are those things. Instead, within functions, um, but so existing function operators. So there are two very useful function operators: per safely and memoirs. Memoirs. <laughs> um I don't know. Um so let's say I'll look at the documentation for the um this safely from Pearl what says about Transforms a function to turn errors into data. You can learn the basic idea that makes it work. Turns error into data. Okay. So you have this list. Um, Accessibly. Okay. Um, okay. So, Bye. Okay. Okay, so this is a list of numbers and characters. There are three vectors of numbers and a character. And then we put inside a rep, so replicating a and a real to the length of x. Okay. Yeah, so when we first have out. It's okay. for um, NAs. Okay, um, this is something that we need to do. Uh, we need to set up an empty thing for four to be able to work and put things inside. So we set up something empty. Yeah, so that's what that line there is doing. Um, so they're numeric NAs. Um, and then it's trying to go along 
the list, so from one to four in the list, and then it's replacing the value in the out vector with the sum of the um, each of the vectors in the list, and then it um, produces an error the last time because it can't sum up. Oops. Um, so then what do we use to turn the error into data? So this, okay, so that was saying that an advantage of for loops is that if one of the iterations fail, you can still get the results up to the failure. So although this produces an error, it works for the first three. Um, so you still got the first three results and then it just failed at the end. Um, but if you put that into a functional, so the per family, then you don't get any output. Um, so it's harder to figure out where the problem lies. So if we'd done the same thing with map, well, X, and then trying to sum that up, then we just get an error and we don't get anything it doesn't it doesn't work at all as opposed to the seek along version we've got three initial correct values so apparently per safely then provides a tool to help with this problem so safely is a function operator that transforms a function to turn errors into data um so we can start by looking at it outside of map double so we do safely sum and look at that it creates this which i guess captures the error i don't really know so like all function operators, safely takes a function and returns a wrapped function, which we can call as usual. So then if we just look at the structure of that, um, so safe sum result numeric, 1.39 error null. No. Okay, for the first. Only the first one. one. Yeah. Oh, and then if you yeah. do it again, then it's got the second one, third, and then presumably the fourth one does have an error. Error has a list of two, and then it has the actual error that has um, occurred. Okay, so uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't see the usability of this uh, like of the function takes a function return a rapid function. Okay, we can see that a function transformed by safely always returns a list with two elements, result in error. If the function runs successfully, the error is null and the result contains the result. If the function fails, the result is null and error contains the error. Now let's use safely with a function. So we say map x was the list and then safely sum sum is just the function, then the structure of that is just those individual results that we've just looked at, but inside a list. So that's just the same. 
kind of thing. Um, we can make the output easier to use by turning it inside out with per transpose. So we get a list of results and a list of errors. Okay. So transpose that result. And then if we look at the structure of that, we've got our four results and then the four um, errors or just null values for error if that's the case. Okay, so, um, uh, but how do you, do you add this inside a function to eventually understand if there's an error? So you can safely see where the error occurs. And then um, how do I use it just this function? Wrap a function to capture error. Okay. So I guess if you're running a function, lots of times on some data and you want to capture whether you've got an error rather than it just breaking. Um, I, I guess. So now we can easily find the results that worked or the inputs that failed. So mm -hmm. okay. okay. Right. Yeah. So that's just going through the this error and just Going, is it null? Okay, so yes. Um, you can use the same technique in many different situations. So some, for example, imagine you're fitting a generalized linear model to a list of data frames. GLMs can sometimes fail because of optimization problems, but you still want to be able to try to fit all the models and later look back at those that failed. Okay, so let's have a look at that example. So our fit model looks like, I'm gonna just move away the notes because I think you need the entire um, book. Uh, so function to a model is a function that takes in the data frame and then it does this linear model. Um, that. Models, it's going to, what's data sets, what's data sets? Data sets are somewhere else. Um, So that the set is already uh, set. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know where that comes from, whether it's from some package or if it's just been defined somewhere. Um, let's see if we can find it. Well, maybe not. Maybe just uh, an, an, an object. So one of the options uh, inside the function that then models. Okay. Which data fail to converge? Okay, you're just supposed to provide your own data set. Um, those. Uh, maybe I didn't. Let's try the. I don't know if I data set. loaded those or not. 
No. Um, okay. Well, that's not going to work as is because we need some data. Um, but I'm not entirely sure what data would work exactly. So, might just go to the next bit. Okay. Um, Okay, okay, just a, a bit, uh, if you scroll a bit up in the chapter before the model, before fit model function, there is this uh, assignment to OK, which is a map logical. It's out and error and is new. So this is OK. And so data set is. Um, Yeah, um, I did a search on the page for data sets and um, it only seems to be within that little section there. Um, okay, so we have this uh, okay <laughs> thing, which is out, out. Um, we can have a look at the, so there's the caching computations with the, I don't know how you pronounce it, memoirs. Um, and so it met, or is it memoirs? I don't know, a function, meaning that the function will remember previous inputs and return cached results. It's an example of the classic computer science trade-off of memory versus speed. Function can run much faster because it stores all of the previous inputs and outputs. But because it does that, it uses more memory. So we can look at a toy example. Um, so slow function that's doing some sleeping. Um, Okay. So when it's slow, when we call it with new arguments, but when we call it with arguments it's seen before, it's really quick. It retrieves the previous value of the computation. Um, um, Okay, so when we do that, mine takes, my computer's quite slow, but mine take, uh, takes two point. Okay. Oh, the elapsed time. is less, but. Um, Okay, so the elapsed time is a lot less when it runs it a second time. A relatively realistic use of memorization is computing the Fibonacci series. Fibonacci series is defined recursively. First two values are defined by convention. A naive version is slow because Fib 10 computes Fib 9 and Fib 8, and Fib 9 computes Fib 8 and Fib 7, and so on. Okay, so let's have a look at that. So this is our Fibonacci function. So if n is less than 2, 
return one. Otherwise, fib n minus two plus fib n minus one. So it's just doing it quite a few times. Um, So if we memorize it, then it makes the implementation much faster because each value is computed only once. So if two system.prime is a lot faster. Um And future calls can rely on previous computations. So if we did that again, but for 24, and then it's really fast. Wow. This is an example of dynamic programming where a complex problem can be broken down into many overlapping subproblems, and remembering the results of a subproblem considerably improves performance. Think carefully before memorizing a function. If the function is not pure, i.e. the output does not depend only on the input, you will get misleading and confusing results. Adley created a subtle bug in DevTools because he memorized the results of available packages, which is rather slow because it has to download a large file from CRAN. The available packages don't change that frequently, but if you have an R process that's been running for a few days, the changes can become important. And because the problem only arose in long running R processes, the bug was very painful to find. Okay. Then there are a couple of exercises um, about reading source code. So, well, the first base R provides a function operator in the form of vectorize. What does it do? When might you use it? So, vectorize creates a function wrapper that vectorizes the action of its argument fund. Data function. Okay. The arguments named in vectorize.args. Okay, Only those that pass in will be vectorized. Okay, let's have a look at the other one. Um, vrep vectorize rep.int. What's rep? Okay. Um, rep dot int just repeats. No? So if that was just no. Okay. I'm just missing. Okay. Okay, and then. It's vectorizing it um, because both are because times is vectorized. So if we did that, then that would, I don't know. Uh, okay. In vectors for each, for each run. For yeah. Each rep uh, replication. Yeah, so if we don't run vectorize on it, then it's just one vector, whereas this has then made it into a list. Um, so I guess this one is clearer because this version just kind of merges it all together. So then... That's why is that different? 
Oh, that's just changed the times and the X around the other way. Um, okay. So it's just inverting it. Then vectorize that times. Times equals one to four, X equals 42. So you're just repeating X that many times. So if you didn't have that. X equals 42 times equals 1 to 4. And you're not allowed to do that unless it has been vectorized. Um, Okay. I'll stop that. Sorry, my my <laughs> Wi-Fi just switched off. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Um, oh, that's a nice separate plot. Okay. Um, okay. So I th that was vectorizing the function, um, which sort of, sort of makes sense, um, to me. Uh, then... So this is a, this is another function operator. Yeah, so it's a function operator that is present in base R. Um, the vectorizer is another function operator. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a case study on creating your own function operators. So it says that the memoirs and safely are very useful, but also quite complex. In this case study, you'll learn how to create your own simpler function operators. Imagine you have a named vector of URLs and you'd like to download each one to disk. That's quite simple with walk to and file download. And that's fine if you've got a handful of URLs, but as the vector gets longer, you might want to add a couple more features, add a small delay between each request to avoid hammering the server, display a dot every few URLs so we know the function is still working. It's easy enough to add these features if we're using a for loop. Um, okay, right, this sounds like it's, it might be just slightly easier to uh, follow. So, oops. And, um, so we've got a couple of URLs. And then, why does that download them to? Um, okay, so we could, if we were doing a for loop, we could add in like a little sleep and um, that path is path, isn't it? Okay. Oh. Um. Okay. As a typo, that should be path, not paths. Um. So I think this for Hadley thinks this for loop is suboptimal because it interleaves different concerns, pausing, showing progress, and downloading. This makes the code harder to read and makes it harder to reuse the components in new situations. Instead, let's see if we can use function operators to extract out pausing and showing progress and make them reusable. So first, let's write a function operator that adds a small delay. I'm going to call it delay by for reasons that will be more clear shortly. And it has two arguments, the function to wrap and the amount of delay to add. The actual implementation is quite simple. 
the main trick is forcing evaluation of all arguments as described in 10.2.5. So that was last week's chapter where you had to force the arguments because function operators are a special type of function factory. So we've got a function called delay by force f force amount function sys dot sleep for whatever amount of time and then it returns a function of those arguments. So the time, if you just use the R unif function, to get a hundred values. And then if you use the delay by function to do the same thing, then it takes longer. Okay. Um, and if we increase the time, then it takes even longer. And we can use it with the original walk two. So walk to the URLs path delay by that. Okay. And this is just downloading these files somewhere. Um um no, so that's just the output. Not sure. Um, okay. Creating a function to display the occasional dot is a little harder because we can no longer rely on the index from the loop. We could pass the index along as another argument, but that breaks encapsulation. The concern of the progress function now becomes a problem that the higher level wrapper needs to handle. Instead, we'll use another function factory trick from the last section so that the progress wrapper can manage its own internal counter. Okay. So. so we add the dot to uh, every few URL so that we know that the function is still working. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so what's this doing? So it takes in function F and N um, forces them both. Then it says I is zero. Then it's a function of whatever the arguments are. Um, I is I plus one, but that then it's like a global, that's I, that's out in the, that on or not, is that just in this environment? Um, so it's, okay. but What is the, the operator in this, in this uh, work is the operator, what is, or, or the dot every? Dot this... every is the, function operator. Okay. Uh, Created dots. Okay. If I divided by n equals zero cat that 
and then it returns a function. So dot every, we're using it. I mean, what, right, if we don't, then use walk. Um, that is just that function. So we're just okay. applying that. So you're applying that function to each of those mm -mm. numbers. So in the meaning of operators is that this new function that we create do, do something uh, that we require them to do. And we can put this function inside another function. Yeah. So they do an operation in the function where we put them in such as creating a dot or delaying uh, the next um, input. So this is um, yeah. Um. The meaning of operator is a, what is an operator? Function operator, yeah. So, okay, so it's a special type of function factory where oh. functions are inputs and then functions are outputs. But in mathematics and computer programming, an operator is a character that represents a specific mathematical or logical action or process. Okay, the, the source of this is... Uh... <laughs> so... Yeah, whereas, like, yeah, I think, I assume kind of function operator is just, is more an R term. such as uh, something that makes something to work or put mm. something into action. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something that makes it, yeah. Um, okay, I divided by function. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't fully understand this because I get that that's them running through the numbers one to 100 and then it's running that function on it. But if you just run it on one number, then you just get all a load of numbers from the uniform distribution, presumably, but you don't get anything that's printed out the dots. So yes. um yeah. I think I'd probably yeah. need to <laughs> Um, okay, now we can there, but then he said, and then it gets harder to read because we're composing many function calls and the arguments are getting spread out. Okay, let's just run this code and see what it looks like. So, um, every delay by okay, um. So we're expressing our original for loop as that. This is starting to get a little hard to read because we're composing many function calls and the arguments are getting spread out. One way to resolve that is to use the pipe. The pipe works well here because 
It's carefully chosen the function names to yield an almost readable sentence. Okay. Um, here, walk to URLs and paths, download file, type to dot every 10, delay by one, quiet equals two. Okay. Um, the more clearly you can express the intent of your code through function names, the more easily others, including future you, can read and understand the code. Okay, um, and then there's some exercises, but yeah. the function I always thinks that do something, so in themselves, so function or functions, so that yeah. they sort of uh, overrate themselves, so no, they they to perform an action function is something that performs some action following instructions. Yeah. I can see how the safely one could be useful. Um, I think I might just need to read through the... Well, wow. okay, <laughs> the oh, bit philosophic, uh, uh, you know, definition because yeah, user define operator. Okay. Oh, I think it's okay. um, it's good. So we went through the chapter. So we now have <laughs> this new definition. Yeah, we have another concept. Yeah. Um. Yeah, of creating lots of functions. So, yeah. Okay. I think. I think that'll probably do on on that one for today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll put stop in there.